Coop's house. It is March Madness, Sweet 16th this weekend. Everyone is all in on men's Cougar basketball. But after the early TV returns, it begs the question, are the women running a better tournament? You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked on Cougs, daily podcast all about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston born teacher and coach, Parker Angel, here to break down all things Cougs. And whether you're a Houston fan or just a hater who came to stop by, thank you for making Locked on Cougs your first listen of the day. If you want to join the conversation down below and you don't know what to say, tell us if you like your queso spicy or creamy. We're not going to let you pick in the middle. Pick one of the two there. A little bit of a debate at the dinner table tonight in the Ainsworth house. So tonight's show, today's show, I'm sorry, is brought to you uh, by FanDuel. More on that in a moment. But we got a couple things to break down as we're in between games here in March Madness. And the first thing I want to talk about, uh, we'll get to in a second, but I want to make sure we talk about things like some unsung heroes and the win over Texas A&M before we move on super far past that one. After the first weekend, I feel like we got some shining moments to talk about no pun intended but things that will be brought up time and time again but first to open today's episode i want to talk about women getting it right now that's not just because monday and i'm recording this on monday night is my wife's birthday happy birthday uh honey at home i will say i'm getting more and more obsessed with women's college basketball as a tournament obviously i follow the same schools i follow i know like it's good to see the cougs doing well uh but there's some things they're doing well that are within college basketball's control and some things that aren't. Uh, women's college basketball has stars, right? And it has stars that could just stay in college for a long time. One of the things I think we love about our Houston Cougar program is so many of the stars outside of like Jarris being a one and done stay at Houston for a long time. We got to see Jamal Shedd grow up, Marcus Sasser grow up, Joe Roberts grow up, uh, Armani Brooks grow up, Quint, uh, Quinn Grimes came here for a little bit. We got to see Gayla Robinson grow up, uh, Corey Davis grow up. Um, over and over again, like you see very few, very rare guys show up for just a one quick and get out to the NBA. And that's why we love our stars. And all of men's college basketball, I think, would stand to benefit as a college basketball product from that, right? You get to know the guys better. And women's college basketball, they have to stay in school at least three seasons before going pro. Um, and you see – that the way that that those stories get built up with the Angel Reese's, the Caitlin Clark's, um, you know, Aaliyah Boston when she was in South Carolina, I've said it right. Um, I that's not entirely within college basketball's control, that's an NBA rule. The guys can go one and done, and da 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 da, right? One thing that is though that is super, super noticeable is something that's been going on for about just over 10 years now, now the 2024 tournament. Um, and that is in women's college basketball, the lower seed, so the one seed, the two seed, the three seed, the always the eight seed, gets to host the opening weekend of the tournament. So if you're the one seed, you're playing back-to-back home games to open the tournament. The two seed as well. Really, it comes down like the eight seed might get to host one game and go on the road the next two days later or whatever, right? Those are the only kind of trickier spots here. Um, the lower seeds, the 14s, the 13s, the 12s, those teams are on the road for both of their first two games. Then the Sweet 16, Elite 8, and Final Four and Championship game, those four rounds in the women's tournament are all at neutral sites, right? So that's much more like the men's tournament. Frankly, a lot of times – the women's final four is at the location the men's final four was at a year prior because it still got the infrastructure set up and so on. Um, as we're watching that tournament get more and more pub, ESPN is doing a pretty good job of putting it out there as a major marketable product. They've kind of moved around when their championship game is. So it's not like after you think of college basketball as having been over, it's now the Sunday between the final four and the men's championship game on the men's side. Um, I think these first two rounds being at home, creates a different kind of atmosphere for fans. It creates an excitement that's palpable on television as I got it going over here. And frankly, moments like 
the Stanford and uh, Iowa State, or was it was Stanford winning at home on Sunday night? Uh, Iowa being sold out and like ear drum bursting loud for Caitlin Clark's last game there, being a tournament game. It, it's impressive. I think that this hypothetical would be beautiful in men's college basketball as well. Um, a, I think it rewards schools for making those higher seeds. So Houston as a one seed would get more of a perk than just being a one seed. You'd also get to play those two games at home. School is a little bit of bank on that, but obviously you also get the comfort of playing at home. Uh, and we'll talk more about how that affects Houston in a second. But as like an eight seed, outside of uh, – you know, getting to wear a certain jersey, there's not a whole lot of difference between eight and nine seed. They're kind of negligible. You play the other seed in the first round, and the second round, you've got the number one seed in the tournament. But if you had a home game as the eight seed, suddenly that's a lot bigger deal. The same thing between a seven seed and a ten seed. Those schools are typically similar programs, a program that had a similar year. But the seven seed getting a home game, suddenly, wait a second, you're starting to see, you know, how – that benefits having a slightly better year for whatever reason that the committee determines you do. I think it's a nice award, frankly, and I think it's one that is worth looking into for men's college basketball. I think we're seeing it work on the women's side. And I think specifically to Houston, and this is where I'll leave us, this would almost guarantee that the Sweet 16 streak that we're at five in a row and counting continues. Um, this year, Big 12 champs, regular season champs, were undefeated at home. Okay, clearly home court advantage works. Last year, they were 16 and 2. Uh, the year before that, 17 and 1, 15 and 0 in 2020, 21, 14 and 2 in 2019, 20, and 19 and 1 in 2018, 19. Those are the six years, because there was no tournament in 2019, 20. The six years that span this five straight Sweet 16 streak. And Houston has lost a combined five games at, or sorry, six games. <laughs> Teach history, not math. A combined six games across those six seasons at home. I think this will be a massive advantage for that first weekend. Uh, I think it's an advantage that you've earned. I also think it's worth pointing out that, like, it's the kind of advantage that incentivizes, like, playing harder in that conference tournament for some schools, right? Like where you're not so, or I mean, it makes that rest versus rust conversation for the schools that'll be between that six and 11 lines. Like schools that are in between that area. Like that makes that tournament a lot more valuable to them very suddenly than it might have been otherwise. You're also going to get to see, because at some point it will be not just the Gonzagas, not just the St. Mary's, but other small schools that had tremendous years potentially get to host that first game as an eight seed, right? Um, or if something crazy happens and, like, you have two upsets in the first round, you may get one of them host as a second-round game in the same weekend, right? I think that's a benefit to this thing, too, that could show off across all of college basketball, the landscape, the schools that we have in this sport. Now, I say that because I'm admittedly watching it. The crowds are fun. Um, and the women's game has done this part right. I don't know how you, you know, uh, put the toothpaste back in the tube, stuff everything back inside of Pandora's box, and go backwards on men's college basketball because the cities that host the first round games, Memphis for where Houston was this year, need to make that money. Memphis wasn't in the postseason, which is funny to laugh at. Um, but Memphis went in the postseason, right? And so that's how that city made money. Um, on postseason basketball, I think all that happens there, you start rotating your Sweet 16 and Elite Eight game sites and Final Four game sites more frequently through more places. Um, I I think there's a way to fin finagle that. I I also think that the perks for these schools is worth it. Um, I I just I think that home court advantage being part of that first weekend of March Madness is a good thing. It makes for better games on television, makes for better crowds. Um, it frankly, getting to watch postseason basketball at home would be tremendous, <laughs> right? Um, I think it's in the women's tournament is doing very right that the men's tournament could do. Again, having stars that are homegrown and been in college basketball for a long time, 
while Houston does it well, is not necessarily, necessarily something that college basketball gets to control. But on the whole, it does feel like this is something that they do and can. And I'd love to see it translate to the men's game. Now, as we talk about the men's game, I want to talk some about shining moments from the AM game and unsung heroes. Before we move past that this week and get ready for the Duke Blue Devils on Friday. But first, as we're talking about the men's game and looking at different ways to make this thing even more interesting, the best way to make it more interesting would be to go to FanDuel, America's number one sports book, where you can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every single game of the tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset or a, a one seed or whatever, time to go dancing on America's number one sports because right now, you can get $200 in bonus bets. You put your first $5 down, and it hits. That's $200 in bonus bets on point spreads, money lines, etc. as long as that first $5 pick hits. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on a bit on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Houston's currently at plus 600 to win the whole thing. You also have them uh, favored by four and a half points against Duke this Friday in Dallas. The over under that one is set at 133 and a half as I'm recording this. That's an interesting line to say the least. This FanDuel America's number one sportsbook right now. Put five dollars down. If that thing hits, you hit big for two hundred dollars back in bonus bets. FanDuel, uh official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Other part about Houston worth mentioning is that Houston's a well oiled machine. If you're trying to keep your well oiled machine up and running, passion drive performance are what bring home the winning trophy. And they also will keep that ride or die alive. eBay Motors got everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level up to peak performance from superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with one, over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for with eBay Guaranteed Fit. Your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusive by eBay guarantee visit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right, so every year at the end of the tournament, after the championship game, it's usually midnight. It's usually, you know, everyone's going to sleep. It's late, but you got to stay up to watch the one Shining Moment song. Now, I know you know this, but for people that have been living under a rock or people that's gone a bit early in the past, the One Chang Moment song is the same classic song every year, but they splice in t- highlights from across the entire NCAA tournament, usually having some extra highlight package for the team that wins it all. And I think this weekend, specifically in the Texas A&M game, you saw at least three, if not more, one shining moment type of moments from the Houston Cougars on the floor and one big, big one after. So the first one is going to be, there'll be whether Houston wins the whole thing or not. I think especially if they win the whole thing though, Houston's got a lead. They're building it. And the highlight that will stick out from this game that is like, He's the player of the year, potentially. He's a finalist for the award. If they win the whole thing, he'll definitely be the uh, MVP of the tournament, most outstanding player of the tournament, et cetera. Um, but Jamal Shedd is about six foot tall, maybe six foot one. Javier Francis spins and has a left hook in the lane, and Jamal Shedd sprints from the three point line, two foot elevates, and puts down the put back with both hands and a big time dunk that gets the entire crowd going up and down crazy. And it's the kind of thing that the, the way the whole play timed out, it's almost like it was made for a highlight reel. The timing of it, you clip it from a bunch of different angles as he's getting the ball in his hands right before putting it down. Uh, you can, Zoom in on the bench and have, I mean, Ramon Walker probably could have gotten called for a take. He jumped up onto the floor. He was so excited from the bench. Um, crazy, crazy play that, frankly, obviously things went haywire. Things went nuts. They almost lost the game. 
but it felt like that was this soul crushing gut punch at the time. It's hard to capture what that moment meant, but I will say the clip itself, A, goes on every Jamal Shed highlight package for like the rest of time, but B, it also will undoubtedly be at least a first weekend clip in the one shining moment song. And then if Houston gets to the final four or farther, man, that thing is going to be a part of that final montage for sure. Um, that's the highlight play from a, like anyone that watches it can tell, Oh my God, that's tremendous. Right. Um, I think one that would need some audio and they do put play by play audio over some of these plays to kind of add to the dramatics of the presentation. Ramon Walker's putback is going to be on this thing. And here's the deal is in the putback audio, you need to have the context. You need to have that this guy tore his meniscus almost exactly a month ago. And he's out here in overtime, the final minutes and possessions of an overtime game against a cross-state rival uh, in a different conference. You don't get to see often enough, but you had a, a greedy game with them earlier in the year. Because honestly, his putback is Damian Dunn misses a great look from three that if he nailed it, might have been the ice. And it's like, oh, but AM is such a great rebounding team. Our bigs are all fouled out. What's going to happen? Ramon Walker just got in the game. He does his Ramon Walker thing and throws his body around recklessly, grabs the ball, is by the basket, puts it in, two points Houston. Um, at the time, felt like another dagger, right? The context, though, that makes a March Madness one shining moment highlight that you need to have the audio from the play-by-play -play for is at some point, because they reference it a couple different times while he's in the game, you got to get one of the announcers pointing out that, like, this guy was not supposed to be healthy yet. How is he doing this? This is tremendous and impressive effort and fighting through pain and so on. That needs to be over the top of it because those two things, the tough, gritty play, from the guy that's been hurt and body Houston Cougar basketball. If you're trying to pick plays out from the tournament thus far that symbolize that, that's got to be it. Last but not least, if I were a betting man, I would say Ryan Alvin at the free throw line, the deep breath, et cetera, that will be also on the highlight reel. Um, frankly, you hear about stories about end of the bench guys making a play or X factors that you don't expect to make a play, making a play or, or whatever. Yeah. The, the Golki kid from Oakland made 10 threes, right? You hear about different things with um, different programs and guys that are on, you never heard of before, whatever suddenly become heroes in March. The country has fallen in love with Ryan Elvin and they've gotten to know him very quickly and Ryan Elvin as a walk-on, admittedly one that could play at a lot of the Division One programs, you and I both know that, but Ryan Elvin as a walk-on, stepping in after being on his butt watching for 44 minutes of basketball, and then leaves him open on purpose, let him catch the ball, and then immediately fouls him. He takes him, walks up, and he misses the first one, frankly, pretty strong. And it... <laughs> Honestly, I I would have to go back and look at the play-by-play -play kind of stuff from his high school career. Those might be the only to anywhere near that degree of importance, certainly the most, only one since high school, important free throws that Ryan Elvin's ever shot, right? And to get the look on his face when, like, even after the first one misses, the supreme confidence because of how many reps he's put in, right, the always ready, right, Stay ready. You ain't got to get ready. That guy also embodies so much of what Houston's about. Um, but the story, the preferred walk-on or the walk-on um, coming in the game and over time and icing the game with the free throws, that's also a very March Madness story. Those two things went together, the iconic Houston culture guy and the iconic March Madness moment. Those things have to be in this as well. I don't know that the audio dub necessarily has to be there, except that it's like, and Ryan Elvin. Like, it's just something to kind of acknowledge who it is because people are falling in love with him online, and rightfully so. He's a good kid. Um, I, I think that that'll be in the one shining moment too. And man, if you told Ryan when he walked on that, you know, was it fall of 20, 
uh, hey, you're, you know, senior year going to be uh, on the one shining moment reel. He'd have laughed. He, he had to. No walk on expects that four years later, but I think he just made it. Now, I think there's a lot of things going on here, and I think that we got to make sure we talk about a couple of different things. But first, got to tell you a little bit about our buddies at Nissan, because right now it's March, it's March Madness, and every week we're doing bracket highlights brought to you by our friends at Nissan. This week we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed farther, and the rest is like any of the 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys are able to take it to the next level. We're going to go across the conference to be nice to our Iowa State Cyclones because they can only be described as a pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have really created a lane for themselves entering the tournament as one of the hottest teams in the country. They have a day with Illinois on Thursday in the Sweet 16, and you can take an adventure just like the Cyclones by taking the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada and go get your next big one today. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, so last but not least, as we move past the AM game, and I'm going to sit on this and dwell because I'm enjoying it. Uh, the players are not, the coaches are not. This isn't, you and I are fans, right? I, I talk about this with my computer every day, and, and I appreciate you listening and making it your first listen of the day, but we don't have to have the same preparation they do. We get to enjoy this a little bit longer, and then we'll start thinking about Duke on Friday. Okay, uh, tomorrow's episode will be talking about Duke at the earliest stages, right? Unsung heroes in this game. And I say to say, like, I think everyone look at those one shining moment type of plays to just talk about Shed or Ramon or Ryan. No one's going to ever forget about the performances those guys had because they are part of the story, part of the history. Uh, it's not going anywhere, right? They're not unsung, right? They're very much sung. Uh, frankly, Jalen Roberts playing on one leg, kind of, and with one hand. Not unsung. We're talking about that all the time. Manuel Sharp getting his career high in a uh, NCAA tournament game. Not unsung. LJ Cryer's point to never going to be unsung. The guys that are going to be unsung, though, that I want to make sure we sing about a little bit. Let's see what I did there. First, Damian Dunn. Damian has had some incredibly high highs and some incredibly low lows this season. And I feel at times like I'm the lone guy standing up for him. Because truthfully, um, we're human beings. Human beings are meant to think of negative things. It's like a weird self-defense thing in Darwin is, I don't know. But people latch on to those low lows with Damian. Think about like the end of the TCU game that Houston lost early in the season, or in the Big 12 conference play anyway, and he didn't pass the ball, right? They think of the end of the Baylor game and how like his defensive mistake ultimately leads to Houston – or missed free throw and the mistake back-to-back -back going into overtime in that game, right? They think of those moments and not the highs, not leading the team in points a couple different times this season, not catch-and-shoot threes, not tremendous defense. In the A&M game, not only did I think he do a particularly good job of playing perimeter defense as a little guy, he played with grown man strength on the inside. Now, I will point out that it's not like he had like the craziest stat line of all time. My man finished with four points, four rebounds, right? Sounds mundane when you consider the guy played 19 minutes. But when you look at the way AM rebounded, there were at least a half dozen plays. And I watched through a fast cast of the game where like you fast forward through free throws and all dead balls are sped up with it, right? Um, I watched a fast cast game for a second time. The amount of times that Damien is throwing his body around recklessly just to make sure the guy he's assigned to does not get the rebound. And I know it's hard to think about like that being successful when you look at like a and got 49 rebounds, right? But if Damien is not doing Damien things, they have closer to 60, right? And sometimes he throws his body in the way and makes sure one guy doesn't get it and another Aggie does. I don't mean to say it's 100% foolproof. But I do think that we don't look at the kinds of things he does that don't show up in the stat book very often as a role player. It's a very different role than he had at Temple, right? Uh, it is a guy that's literally playing his first NCAA tournament ever as a fifth season or fifth year of college guy, right? A grown man with a son at home, and it's his first time in the tournament. 
and he's playing very well. Now, he had a lot of time with the four, battling with true bigs. Um, you know, we can talk about early in the first half, he breaks the tie game with a great dribble pull-up in the short corner, over an outstretched hand. Um, I thought his move where he had like a pass fake, and then came back with his right hand and got in the lane, and they got the defense off his back and hit a little mid lane uh, jumper, uh, feet up in the air for a long time on that one. That was an impressive shot. And then, frankly, we talked earlier about Ramon and the rebound. But I thought the three that Damon caught and shot right before that, while he did miss it, and Ramon Walker got the put in, uh, the put back. I do think that that was a very well timed shot, very well orchestrated shot, and frankly. The speed with which he catch and shot it when he normally makes – he shoots a fairly high percentage from three on catch and shoot. Um, I thought that was a pretty good look, right? He was one or two of those good looks away from, oh, my God, he had a good game kind of moments, right? But the effort he played with in fighting for rebounds, even if he only got four, I think it's worth mentioning because, truthfully, they needed every single one of those efforts. The other guy is Malik Wilson. Malik is a quiet dude. Um and again, I mentioned this. I can't remember if it was in the post game show or on Twitter. But truthfully, Malik is the kind of guy that like kind of got beaten down along the way. At Texas Tech didn't work out. He he looks for a new home and lands in Houston's got to take the red shirt last year. Shows up to try and play him at backup point guard. That's not really the right role for him. Now he's moved out to a shorter stretch for long-armed wing type of guy off the ball a little bit. Um, he himself had nine points and six rebounds in 25 minutes. But what I thought was interesting was if you watch how a and nine points, not like a crazy high score, Houston had three starters at 20 or more. Jalen Roberts had 13. I mean, like, truthfully, while it was the fifth highest point total on the team at nine points, there's a big gap between him and number three, right? Um, but – Malik, once he hit one or two of those back cuts, because he's so, so crazy fast and so explosive and leaps at the rim, and you can't do anything about it while he's doing up and unders and crafty stuff around the basket. Um, once he, he's done that once, all of a sudden, a and started covering him a lot different. Yes, he had a corner three that helped some too, but he pulled guys out of the lane because they couldn't let him cut without any contact, and that meant they had to get out – by him, where they could provide the contact once they were out of the lane for the things like Jamal Shad driving and J1. And so, like, all, all that plays itself together. Then Malik's a tremendous defender. His defense was important. Uh, frankly, we talk a lot about Wade Taylor's bad day on offense. Uh, he ended up with 21 points, but it took him 26 shots to get there. Wade Taylor's three of 13 on threes. I mean, that kind of, that's not, that's, that's Houston holding him to low percentages that end up being a lot of points because it's huge, a lot of shots. Right. Um, Malik played a lot of that defense that kept him to low shooting percentages. Right. Because Malik and Jamal pretty much drew that assignment together. And when it was Malik's turn, he did very, very well. Uh, again, he, he, like, I guess if you're talking about like moments that at the end of the game that could have, would have, should have, he gets called for a really weird jump ball that leads to the Garcia three directly. Right. So the, the Garcia three is an inbounds play after a jump ball. That ties the game since it's overtime. That jump ball flatly didn't happen. Malik Wilson got that rebound, and they hadn't even really tried to foul him yet. That should have just been Houston ball, right, as the clock was expiring. Um, and so they called jump ball, and Garcia had the three, and it went to overtime. But that rebound in and of itself, had the game just been called correctly, would have been game ceiling, right? And again, with AM doing the things they were doing rebounding, that's not a given, right? We can't just take that for granted. Malik, Damon, the lone two high minute bench guys, frankly, um, played tremendously in this game amongst all the efforts and things that get talked about this as it gets added to Houston Cougar folk folklore. We can't let those guys' efforts go to waste. Now, we've talked a lot about this AM game, could talk a lot more about it. But we've got Duke Friday. And so Wednesday's episode is going to be starting to look towards Duke. Same with Thursday, same with Friday. If spring football news pops in, we'll talk some about that as well. All things Houston Cougars here each and every day at Locked on Cougs. And we thank you for making us your first listen. Please hit subscribe so you get a little ding to let us know that let you know that we're here each and every day as we appreciate you the latest on the Houston Cougars. Locked on Cougs is a proud member of the Locked on Podcast. Everything is your team. 
Our Cougars are number one Houston Cougars in the Sweet 16 each and every day. Go Cougs.